And on behalf of the Mexican Studies Group and the Wilner Center, welcome to today's panel, 21st Century Mexican Art and Literature. Um, two of the presentations will be in English and one will be in Spanish. The discussion will be in English and Spanish. So uh, we have, uh, because of technical reasons, we had to switch around the presentations. So we are going to begin with Professor uh, Diana Valencia. She will speak in Spanish, and then the, the other two speakers will speak in English. And her, uh, the title of her presentation is Caída Libre by Marta Cerda, New York in Fragments. Um, you have the program here, so I am not going to read uh, their bio bibliographies. Uh, uh, I'm just going to say that, that Diana Valencia is professor of Spanish and chair of the Department of Culture, Arts, and Languages at the University of San Job San Joseph's, and she has uh, uh, she has published uh, a lot, particularly on Octavio Paz, the Mexican writer. Uh, one of the most uh, prolific writers of the 20th century. Okay, well, Diana, go ahead. Gracias, Araceli. Mm. Buenas tardes. Deseo agradecer su presencia a los estudiantes, profesores, personal administrativo de la Universidad de la Ciudad de Nueva York, a mis compañeros panelistas y al público que nos acompaña esta hermosa tarde de primavera. Agradezco a la doctora Araceli Tinajero su amable invitación a formar parte de este panel y la felicito por su tenaz labor a favor de las artes y las letras mexicanas, especialmente las contemporáneas, a las cuales Araceli siempre ha dedicado especial atención. Deseo mencionar asimismo al profesor Mauricio Font, director del prestigioso Centro Cultural Wilner, a Rosalina López por su diligente coordinación del evento Y en forma remarcable, agradezco a mi amiga y compatriota, Marta Cerda, la autora de Caída Libre, su presencia hoy con nosotros. Ella hizo viaje especial desde la ciudad de Guadalajara para acompañarnos en la presentación. Quisiera pedirle a Marta que por favor se pusiese de pie y al público que le brindase un amable aplauso de bienvenida. Y sobre todo... Quisiera animarlos a que al final de la charla le hagan algunas preguntas a ella, ya que pocas veces tenemos la suerte de tener entre el público al autor de la obra que discutimos. Tuve el primer contacto con Caída Libre durante la Feria Internacional del Libro de Guadalajara en el año 2011. Fui invitada entonces para presentar su primera edición al lado de Víctor Cuellar, un creditoso, un acreditado y erudito profesor de aquella ciudad. También formó parte del panel la autora, obviamente, y Jorge Orendain, director de La Sonámbula. Editorial Tapatía, que publicó el libro. Vale la pena mencionar la importante labor que desempeñan estas empresas regionales para la publicación de las obras de las nuevas generaciones de escritores de la provincia mexicana. Destacan en Guadalajara la mencionada Sonámbula, Ediciones Arlequín, La Luciérnaga, Literalia y Ediciones Castilla, Castillo en la ciudad de Monterrey. Sus esfuerzos están fincados en dar a conocer la obra de los escritores jóvenes mexicanos, lo cual es un desafío cultural, porque la mayoría de las personas que desean tener éxito tratan de publicar sus libros en la Ciudad de México. Y estas editoriales de provincia han brindado este espacio que junto con la Feria Internacional del Libro está poco a poco comenzando a acreditar la provincia mexicana y de construir un poco la idea del centralismo mexicano. La creatividad de los artistas regionales se despliega asimismo en el área creativa, como en el caso del diseño gráfico de Alberto Mellón, que ilustra la cubierta de caída libre, lo tenemos ahí atrás. Se titula Yo quiero ser y tiene varios niveles de composición que van desde el claro oscuro a la superposición de elementos fragmentarios. Incluyen un avión de papel con un mensaje escrito en el anverso, lanzado por una ventana desde una mano anónima, quizá un último y desesperado intento en busca de auxilio. Cuatro rostros masculinos miran desde el fondo, parecen provenir de una realidad temporal otra. 
En el primer plano destaca el armazón de un sofá suspendido en el aire en movimiento perpendicular. Sobre él flota un hombre desnudo en posición fetal, viene cayendo en movimiento libre, como sucede en los sueños. La portada hace eco al título Caída Libre, que según la física indica el efecto de la gravedad que hace que un cuerpo se desplome sin ninguna otra interferencia como el aire. En este caso, la imagen de la portada es una evocación y un homenaje a los hombres y a las mujeres que se lanzaron desesperados de las Torres Gemelas en llamas y su inminente desplome, el fatídico 911. La novela recuerda el día de los ataques de la, desde la perspectiva de Magda, la narradora protagonista del relato, y dice, cito, parecían muñecos, ¿sabes? Muñecos de trapo, tal vez lo sean. Caían lentamente como si fueran planeando en el aire. Todos somos muñecos de trapo, cayendo al abismo. Fin de cita. Estas palabras adquieren una dimensión profunda al ser reídas paralelamente a los fragmentos que ilustran la cubierta del libro, donde el abismo evocado admite leerse como la corriente del destino que inexorablemente nos conduce a un final, a una vocación o a una misión. No es difícil para el lector identificar a Magda como el doble literario de Marta Cerda y deducir que la escritura misma reflexiona acerca del valor del azar, del mundo de los sueños y el valor fragmentario del destino humano, como nos enseñó el surrealismo bretoniano en la modernidad. Para hacer de la ficción, es un juego de posibilidades que necesariamente deben incluir un aspecto lúdico y hasta deliberadamente naif. La inocencia primordial de la que hablan los surrealistas, y aprendió la autora de sus lecturas de cabecera, Borges, Cortázar, Juan José Arriola, pero también Juan Rulfo y Paul Auster, a quien admira mucho Marta Cerda. La obra se organiza como una suma de fragmentos o collage de estampas, como se advierte en la nota preliminar. Es un corredor de voces donde se dan cita varias obras y poemas con el tema de Nueva York, que le incluyen los famosos versos del poeta mexicano Juan José Tablada, que están tan próximos a nosotros esta tarde. Mujeres de la Quinta Avenida, tan cerca de mis ojos, tan lejos de mi vida. Hay también referencias más extensas a Poeta en Nueva York de Federico García Lorca y a Manhattan Transfer de John Dos Pasos, sin faltar el cineasta por excelencia de la ciudad, Woody Allen. Sin embargo, es una novela corta o nouvelle tejida primordialmente en torno a dos ejes la memoria histórica de la ciudad de Nueva York y la memoria personal de Magda, la protagonista. El primer relato inicia con el surgimiento y edificación de la ciudad, desde sus humildes inicios con las expediciones de Berranzano en 1524 y Henry Hudson en 1609, que en el presente han dado el nombre al famoso puente Berranzano Bridge, que conecta los distritos de Staten Island y Brooklyn con Nueva York, y al emblemático río Hudson, que delimita los estados de Nueva York y New Jersey. La historia de la fundación de Nueva York llega hasta el presente y converge con el relato autobiográfico de Magda desde la primera visita a la Gran Manzana que realizara en los años 60 del siglo pasado, formando parte de una excursión de colegialas escoltadas por dos monjas católicas. Hasta el presente de la escritura en el año 2011, fecha de la conclusión del manuscrito. La autora, por casualidad, estuvo aquí en la ciudad de Nueva York el día fatídico del 9-11 de 2001. Y ese fue un elemento muy importante para la escritura de la obra. La historia de la fundación de Nueva York detalla sus orígenes como plaza comercial holandesa, destinada al embarque de las pieles de los animales cazados en la ribera de los grandes lagos, su posterior filiación como colonia inglesa en el siglo XVII por el duque de York, Jacobo II, quien se apoderó de ella en 1664 sin disparar una sola bala. Más tarde desempeñó un papel fundamental la ciudad 
de Nueva York en el movimiento de insurrección contra Inglaterra y llegó a ser la capital de la Unión hasta 1797. En los siglos XIX y XX sobresalió por su distintiva arquitectura de rascacielos y sus pulmones. Central Park, que fue descrito por la revista Harper's, según relata Cerda, cito, como radiante en medio de un ambiente mágico de arte y buen gusto. Fin de cita. Wall Street marca el poderío económico de Estados Unidos en el siglo XX y lo que va del XXI. El relato histórico en torno a Nueva York establece en el discurso que desde sus inicios los signos de esta ciudad han sido el comercio a gran escala, el carácter multietnico y cosmopolita y añadiríamos la capacidad para refundarse fortificada después de cada catástrofe que incluye invasiones, incendios, atentados a personas individuales como el célebre contra John Lennon, hasta grandes hecatombes de sus símbolos emblemáticos como Wall Street y la Gran Depresión. Esta capacidad de refundición y de refundación a partir de las ruinas distingue a Nueva York como un ave fénix, se edifica fortificada sobre sus propias ruinas. En caída libre, Marta Cerda hace un alto en su carrera y retorna a sus orígenes, realiza un balance del camino recorrido como madre, esposa y mujer, también como escritora y promotora cultural. Esta obra recapitula y cierra una etapa de su quehacer. Ya en la madurez de su trayectoria intelectual, es el momento de preguntarse, ¿qué he hecho con mi vida? Al realizar una suma y un balance de ello, puede tomar un momento de reposo para concluir una etapa y dar la vuelta a la página para pasar a la siguiente era creativa, la cual seguramente ya está en su tintero. Caída libre es breve y de ágil lectura. Lo breve es y bueno, doblemente bueno, como afirmó el poeta Gracián. Es una novela realista con tenues destellos de realismo mágico como Las lágrimas de Magda al ver por primera vez Nueva York, presagio del 11 de septiembre del 2001. Y hasta encontramos una novela rosa sugerida mediante los diálogos que ilustran el triángulo amoroso entre Luis, el esposo de Magda, y su amante, Amanda, la protagonista. El desliz amoroso del esposo de Magda se narra seguido de un flashback a los años 60 en los Estados Unidos, llamados la época de Camelot o los Kennedy. Son los sonados romances extramaritales del presidente, siendo el más famoso y trágico de ellos, el sostenido con Marilyn Monroe, que se menciona en el relato que nos ocupa. También tiene destellos de testimonio autobiográfico y novela histórica. El personaje de Magda fácilmente, como decíamos ya, se identifica con el otro yo literario de Cerda. De ahí podemos obtener grandes enseñanzas. Las mujeres de su generación, y todas aquellas que alguna vez nos hemos preguntado qué he hecho con mi vida. La suya es ejemplo de una existencia edificante que se ha construido paso a paso y contra la corriente central de la capital mexicana. Esta dificultad para forjarse una carrera literaria es doblemente difícil para una mujer, aún en la Atenas de México, como lo es Guadalajara. Baste señalar que Marta ha sido una gran escritora y, pro, y promotora cultural. Ella no pertenece a institución alguna, las ha fundado. Ella fundó la SOGEM, que es la Escuela de Escritores en Guadalajara, y el Centro del Pen Club para también la ciudad de Guadalajara. Instituciones que apoyan a las nuevas generaciones de mujeres y hombres escritores, y todo ello con gran discreción y modestia, sin gritar ni alterarse con la afabilidad de trato que caracteriza a las personas que realmente valen. Para terminar, quiero decir que leí Caída Libre con gran placer y de un tirón. Me gustó mucho. Es una obra de madurez en la cual la autora nos hace preguntarnos a cada uno de los lectores qué he hecho con mi vida. Y en realidad nunca es tarde para plantearse un recomenzar en nuestras vidas. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Professor Diana Valencia. Our next speaker is uh, uh, Pablo Elguera. Pablo, welcome back. It's always a pleasure to have you here. 
Uh, he's a visual uh, artist living in New York, uh, very prolific. Uh, he, um, if I had to tell you all the, all the things that um, exhibitions and workshops and things that he does, it, uh, it will take me all afternoon. Um, at the end, I would like to know, uh, uh, to hear from you about your uh, biblioteca, uh, no, no, libreria Don Celes. So we'll talk a little bit at the end if you like. So. Um, I'm going to pass this around in case you don't have the um, the programs, all right? And uh, so otherwise it will take us longer. Thank you, Pablo. Gracias, Araceli. Uh, as mentioned, I will speak in English, but I'll be happy to take questions in Spanish. Con gusto podemos hablar en español posteriormente. Um, my presentation uh, will differ from the others, my fellow presenters, in the sense that I'm not going to give you a uh, a, uh, a paper. Um, however, I will speak, you know, personally from experience and specifically from my own practice as an artist uh, on the relationship between art and literature. Something that I feel always very implicated, um, and I would like to make a few points uh, about that relationship to start with. Um, in uh, the visual arts, in, and uh, we uh, apply literary, the literary theory as well as critical theory. Um, to make sense of what uh, is produced in contemporary art. Um, and I would say there is a short-term and a long-term approach to this application. The short-term approach uh, mostly is understood under the rubric of visual literacy, meaning the idea that works, that artworks, visual artworks, are readable, quote-unquote, uh, objects that the eye can decode. Uh, and it so happens um, uh, with literature that uh, there's a, there's the, the problem of readability uh, of a, a work and that is subject to interpretation. Uh, the long-term approach, of course, deals with history and with, and particularly with our history, with the idea that we that the different works of art constitute a historical narrative that uh, some places, for example, the place where I work at the Museum of Modern Art, is known as the canon or the modernist canon. And uh, museums generally are, are understood as these sites where this narrative is displayed. So these are things that I think about on a, on a daily basis as both an educator uh, who works in a museum, as an artist. And, um, and I also grew up in an environment where uh, I was surrounded by writers and people uh, belonging to the literary scene. Uh, so going into the visual arts uh, was like a break of that relationship, but it has come back in my work in a variety of ways. And I will just give you a few um, examples of how that's happened. Um, one of the literary, um, I guess, uh, devices that uh, the that 20th century and before uh, has used is the heteronym, things that, that we associate with uh, poets like Fernando Pessoa. And I was thinking about the heteronym when I produced this exhibition called Estacionamientos, Parking Zones in Mexico City in 1998, where I decided to uh, create 14 different artists uh, and uh, making them into my heteronyms. In other words, uh, grabbing uh, people who I could imagine their lives, their historical and, and aesthetic perspectives. And I presented the, uh, the exhibition as a group show, not as a solo exhibition. So we had people like Matthew Rich, who in theory was a, an, an American artist who was obsessed with map making. Ramiro Yañez Virgen, an Argentinian artist who was uh, making interactive conceptual games. And Marina Nancy Duch, who was a, an Egyptian artist uh, making uh, installations of pillows and plane crashes. Uh, so of course, all these things are objects that I produce myself. But uh, in the context of the exhibition, the uh, visitors were presented with this material as uh, the actual biographies of the artists and critical commentary on these, on these works. <clears throat> um, and you know, as, as an educator, I am, uh, as I mentioned, very, very interested in the way that objects get read in galleries, and specifically the relationship between the object and the, uh, the exhibition label. Um, so I, um, in, the, in the early 2000s, I did a number of experiments uh, with uh, art interpretation. Uh, taking objects that were actually very hard to see and showing how the narrative of the wall uh, explanation tends to manipulate and, and sometimes uh, take over the actual um, process of looking. Uh, so in this project called Mock Turtle, uh, you were supposed to see this object in this black box that was supposed to be a turtle. 
and, uh, and you were confronted with hundreds of different uh, labels and explanations about what the work was, and many of them contradicting one another and questioning even the work as, a, as, a, as, a, as an artwork. And I have produced a number of guides, um, uh, exhibition guides, uh, family activity guides uh, about the object itself. Uh, it, it really, Mock Turtle really was a, um, a, uh, a play on, a, on Lewis Carroll, Alice in Wonderland, a really wonderful book that has this character called Mock Turtle. And, um, and specifically, uh, um, the, um, the Little Prince by Antoine de Saint-Exupéry uh, that has a very uh, wonderful se uh, section where the Little Prince asks the pilot, can you draw me a lamp? The, the pilot hesitates um, and draws a lamp, and the little prince says, this is not nice enough, this is too, too thin, this is too fat, this is too little, too big, draw me another and another. So after, after a while, he gets exasperated and decides to draw a box with a hole, telling him, your lamp is inside this box. <laughs> and the little prince says, oh, this is beautiful. The, the, the lamp is so happy inside this box, I can see her jumping and such. In other words, uh, imagination, and the, the capability of interpretation is what really enriches the, the picture. And, uh, and it's one of what I see, one of the interesting contradictions that, that sometimes um, um, takes place when we are in the galleries and we want. Um, and this project was called Parallel Lives. And um, it's another experiment in the readability of objects and readability of exhibitions. Um, when I produced this exhibition, I, I became really interested in creating a show that actually was about five, uh, uh, com uh, five continuous, five uh, n possible narratives for the same exhibition. So you will go through an exhibition and pick an acoustic guide, and each acoustic guide will tell you a completely different story about what the exhibition was. And each exhibition was inspired on the life of a particular artist. So it was another attempt in which I tried to uh, think about the exhibition um, as a, a, a narrative but in an inverted way, in not, not in the sense that the objects generate narratives, but then the narratives actually generate uh, objects, and the objects have to conform with the narratives that are being presented. This is something that we normally um, uh, kind of relate to, to what's known as institutional critique. Institutional critique um, uh, is a questioning of the way that we look at objects, the way that we interpret objects. The, um, this, this project uh, is a... Um, a critique on the process of conservation, and uh, um, particularly the process of conservation of language. Uh, every two weeks, the last speaker of a language dies, uh, and within our lifetimes, um, the half of the world's languages will be completely extinct. Um, so um, what I did with this project was to work with a phonograph uh, recorder to, uh, to go and, uh, and basically capture the sounds of um, uh, on the voices of last speakers around the world, creating, um, using not the, la the latest technology, but the earliest technology to produce this combination of, um, <clears throat> this collection of voices. And the, the phonograph, which was invented by Thomas Alva Edison in the, in the 1800s, uh, is this very delicate wax object that gets recorded by a diamond needle <clears throat> and uh, making the voice or, or whatever sound you're recording something very uh, fragile and uh, and very physical, that once it's broken, it's gone forever. Uh, I travel through northern Mexico where there's a great wealth of languages, but at the same time where there's many languages in the process of extinction to record the last speakers. Uh, a woman who is Kumiai, who's here in a town called Tecate, across from San Diego, from the border. Uh, and another woman who's Cucapá. Uh, the Cucapás are from, from the area of Sonora. And uh, there's really wonderful um, uh, narratives and uh, uh, storytelling and the myths of origin that the Kukapas have. And through this project, I always try to, uh, to present to, to the viewer um, the ironies of, uh, of, 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 uh, of, of preservation, and particularly try to make us think what would be like to be the last speaker of your own language. What is really that, that specificity of culture that is lost uh, when you lose a language? Um, I, I, I won't get into details on these other projects because we don't have much time. But um, what I have done in, uh, in past projects is to employ uh, historical traditions. Uh, in this case was a medieval celebration called uh, the Feast of the Ass um, to, to create uh, celebrations and uh, inside the, in this case, the Museo Carrillo Gil in, the, in Mexico City uh, to question, um, to help people uh, question their own social roles 
and uh, and become uh, freer in the in in, uh, in, a, in a particularly artistic uh, uh, experience. The, the Feast of the Ass was a, um, a medieval celebration where all the social roles will be subverted and changed. So if you were rich, you will behave like you were poor. If you were poor, you will behave like you were rich. If you were a man, you will behave like a woman. If you, if you were young, you will behave like you were old. And the, the ass, the, the donkey, was dressed like the pope and brought into the church. Uh, uh, during the Feast of the Ass, what we did is we asked everybody to take roles that they had never attempted before. So, so the general public became our critics. Uh, the curators were invited to be artists. Uh, the artists were invited to be critics. And uh, we kind of reverted all these roles. It became very controversial for some people who particularly were in the, in the hierarchy of the art world. That, that is a hierarchy of power. So, so curators were not very comfortable uh, trying to behave like artists. You know? But artists were very comfortable be, being curators, of course. You know? but, but in a way, it's kind of like uh, similar to the, uh, uh, to the literary devices that, that are employed in, in novels. You know, the only thing is that when you, when you bring them with performance art into, into their real world, like everything changes, so um, all these projects really have a a, um, a, uh, a desire to subvert um, the 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 and or change the, the the scripted roles that we all fulfill in society. Uh, and I just want to mention uh, one one last project, which is Libreria Donceles, uh, and that uh, Araceli mentioned too, um, in in regards to this relationship between art and and literature. Uh, I, I, as mentioned, I grew up in a, in a world of, of literature and writers, and I'm, I'm a bibliophile. I'm someone who loves uh, bookstores, and I'm very pained by the fact that used bookstores are disappearing in, in, in New York City. Um, now, if you know um, Mexico City, you would know that downtown, uh, you can find practically any item uh, in, the, in the, the streets downtown, and each street usually is dedicated to one particular item. So if you go to the street of Donceles, one of the oldest streets in, in, uh, in the Americas, you will find used books and get lost in the stacks of, the, of these bookstores finding uh, cheap materials. Uh, it's a place that I grew up in, you know, that I, I always, without any money as a student, would try to find books to, uh, to, um, to enrich myself you know, with them. And uh, thinking in, in New York City, and speaking of Juan Tablada, Jose Juan Tablada, who was mentioned before, um, Jose Juan Tablada, when he was in New York in the, in the early 20s, he decided to open a bookstore on his own. Uh, it was a bookstore in Spanish, Libreria de los Latinos. Now, uh, Jose Juan Tablada was a great poet, but he was a terrible businessman. <laughs> and unfortunately, his bookstore did not last very long. It was a, a maybe a year-long project. Uh, I thought it would be a fantastic idea to fail like Tablada did, and I started a bookstore uh, to serve the two million uh, Latino immigrants that, that exist in New York City. So I went to Mexico City to start a campaign giving out uh, small objects and collages to, um, to people who might donate books. Uh, it started small, but then after we got some attention for the project, we got an avalanche of, of, uh, of donations from people from all walks of life, um, people who were teachers, who were um, artists, who were uh, secretaries, who were children bringing their children's books. And uh, as you, if, you, if you know Mexico City, you will know that there's a lot of people who, live, who have lived in houses, middle, middle class people who have they're, they've been in the same house for 20 or more years. So you accumulate things. So people found it very convenient to just come and bring whatever they had. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty soon we were pretty full. Uh, <laughs> we filled an entire house of, of, of books. Uh, 25,000 books that we had to basically um, fundraise to bring to New York City. And uh, after we managed to do that, uh, we opened on La Libreria Donceles. Uh, this was in 2013. Uh, and um, it was essentially um, put together in a very intuitive way for me, you know, trying to find old lamps and, and carpets and things like that. Later I realized I was kind of recreating my mom's apartment. <laughs> 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 and uh, uh, because it, it's indeed a very personal project, but it's also very, um, it's very much about socializing, very much about being together. And the one thing that really characterized our bookstore was the tertulias, you know, these events that we were doing every week where anything could happen, you know, poetry readings, uh, conversations, book clubs, style discussions, uh, anything that people would like to propose, we were open to. 
And what happened later was, of course, in uh, facing the New York uh, reality of real estate, we couldn't stay in this gallery forever. And we started to, um, to go around the country to present our bookstore. Uh, so we went to Phoenix, Arizona, uh, where we uh, took a small locale uh, supported by the university. And in Arizona, it was really important to do this project because of the anti-immigrant um, sentiment that exists in the state and the very conservative uh, policies against immigration. Uh, and um, uh, in San Francisco, we, another location, we had a small location that um, that was in the Mission District, uh, which used to be a Latino-dominated district, now has been gentrified. But it was a very successful small uh, space that celebrated Latino culture uh, and where we actually made money. Uh, and uh, this is also to, to mention that all the money that the bookstore makes gives it back to local Latino organizations that support the Spanish language. So it's not a project that that is meant to make any money. It's, it's a project that is really intended to connect individuals with um, the, the, the object of the book to create these uh, deep personal connections. Um, just to, um, well, the project continues, but I should mention that we did bring it back to New York City, to the neighborhood of Red Hook, which is where I live in Brooklyn, uh, where, as you may know, was heavily affected by Hurricane Sandy. And uh, this was a way to try to reinvigorate and bring back uh, vitality to, to that neighborhood. But what I think, what I would say Don Celis uh, is to me a, an example of the way in which uh, literature and the visual arts uh, interrelate, uh, the way in which we, we confront issues of narrative, the way we confront issues of, uh, of the, the personal and, and the theoretical uh, with art, and the way in which art is, um, it creates not just an object, it's not just about creating an object to be read, but also to create a space for readability, a place where, where individuals can connect very personally with an experience and can make sense of that experience in their own uh, very uh, intimate way. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pablo Elguera. Our next speaker is uh, Professor Juan de Castro. Uh, he is Associate Professor in Literary Studies at uh, the New School of, for Liberal Arts. Uh, he has published uh, lately, uh, particularly on the um, um, uh, present uh, literature uh, about uh, Vargas Llosa and also about uh, he's the co-editor of, of a very important book uh, entitled Roberto Bolaño as World Literature, which is that's forthcoming, but also forthcoming, you are yeah. forthcoming, but you also co-edited uh, uh, Roberto Bolaño and After. Is that correct? A contemporary Spanish American novel. Bolaño and after. Thank you. You have the, <laughs> you have here the details. Thank you. Uh, uh, welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much, Araceli. Want to read from here or? I'll, I'll read from there. It's, it's up to you, really. It's okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Araceli, for inviting me. I guess I'm the only non-Mexican here, so <laughs> I appreciate very much the invitation. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Alejandro González Iñárritu's film or as he calls himself now, G, Alejandro G. Iñárritu, <laughs> and especially Babel. Uh, unfortunately, I'm going to read. So if, so I'll start. If neoliberalism divides society into winners and losers, then Mexican director Alejandro González Iñárritu, who with Bergman began to sign his films as, as Alejandro G. Iñárritu, mm -hmm. must be counted among the biggest winners in the world of film. In fact, one must note that today's Hollywood, however we define this slippery noun in our deterritorialized times, has for the first time embraced Latin American directors as major figures. Moreover, as the travails inflicted on Leonardo DiCaprio and earlier on the poor dogs of Amores Perros show, he has even taken on the role of official Hollywood martinet a position once reserved for German directors like Fritz Lang. One must remember that otherwise successful directors like the Mexican Emilio Fernandez during the classic studio period, or in the 1980s, the Argentinian Luis Puenzo, best known for the official story. And in the 1990s, the also Mexican Alfonso Arau, the director of Like Water for Chocolate, 
all failed to make much headway in Hollywood. Even the Spaniard, of course, now I'm talking about decades earlier, but even the Spaniard, Luis Buñuel, despite his earlier successes in Paris, ended up leaving Hollywood for Mexico. G. Iñárritu's career and those of Guillermo del Toro and Alfonso Cuarón, the three amigos, thus represent the meritocratic phase of neoliberal globalization. That is the creation of an open world market for goods and services. This in addition to the putative promotion of individual freedom by diminishing the reach of the state has been one of the selling points for the unfettered free market as the way to utopia, not only in Mexico and Latin America, but also throughout the world. There is a direct correlation between G. Iñárritu's films and the social processes that have made his rise to fame possible. In particular, his first three films, all made in collaboration with writer Guillermo Arriaga and cinematographer Rodrigo, Rodrigo Prieto, Amores Perros, 2001, 21 Grands, 2003, and especially Babel, 2006, can be seen as representative works in every meaning of the phrase of our globalized neoliberal world. However, if G. Iñárritu's career can be seen as illustrating the utopian promise behind neoliberal globalization, that is, of a world meritocracy beyond nationality, gender, race, or religion, his films often unwittingly present the hierarchies to be found hidden in the promises of the free market. As in, as in the earlier movies, let me, as in the earlier movies in the Riaga Prieto trilogy, Babel tells the stories of disconnected characters who come into some sort of contact through tragic happenstance. However, while in Amores Perros and 21 Grams, the divisions among the characters originate in the economic and social inequality of Mexico City and of an unnamed city in the United States, in reality, Memphis. The plot of Mob Babel moves from Morocco to the United States, Mexico borderlands, to Tokyo, switching back and forth in geography and on occasion in chronology. In Babel, class, culture, and language seem to be placed onto a global south-north grid. The plot is set in motion when Yusef, a child Berber shepherd portrayed by Boker Ait El Kaid, tries out a rifle by aiming at a tourist bus and hits the wife of an American couple, Susan and Richard Jones, portrayed by Clay Blanchett and Brad Pitt. Susan's condition is serious, and they are forced to stay longer in Morocco than planned. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Mexican, their Mexican nanny, Amelia, played by Adriana Barraza, who is looking after their young son and daughter in San Diego during the emergency, decides to take them to Mexico to attend her son's wedding. They get lost in the desert on the way back. In Tokyo, the police tries to contact the former owner of the rifle, Yasujiro Wataya, portrayed by Koji Yakusho, whose daughter Chieko, portrayed by Rinko Kikushi, and she also appears in Del Toro's Pacific Rim, by the way, uh, is going through an emotional crisis due to the death of her mother. Unlike the first two films of the trilogy, in which a car accident links otherwise disconnected lives, Babel presupposes contact among some of the characters as the chief condition that makes the plot possible. G. Iñárritu's Babel has been described as a uniquely multicultural film, an interpretation shared by the director in his words, and I'm quoting, Babel is about the point of view of others. It literally includes points of views as experienced from the other side. It is not about a hero. It is not about only one country. It is a prism that allows us to see the same reality from different angles. While Babel is a foreign language film in some countries, in others, it is a local film. Today, it is no longer about cultural or language barriers. It's emotion and humanity that make the connection in our global community." End of quote. 
G. Inyaritu thus presents the film as a correction to the biblical story of Babel. He claims to be tapping a previously untapped potential in the film medium itself, because it is in English, Spanish, Arabic, Japanese, and sign language. Chieko is deaf, because it is apparently a tricontinental film, because it has multicultural characters. Babel would contradict the monocultural and monolinguistic misunderstanding that underlies mainstream movies. Thus in, in, ba I'm sorry. Thus in Babel, Gonzalez Iñárritu would have made use of the affective capacity of the film medium and the possibilities it has to present diverse cultures and languages to suture the wound of the biblical Babel. But is this the case? Much has been made, oh, I shouldn't get there yet. Much has been made of the myriad manners in which the film, the films made by G. Iñárritu have broken with the earlier traditions of Mexican film. If the so-called golden age Mexican films made during the 1930s, 40s, and 50s often idealized the provinces as the location of Mexico's essence, Amores Perros presented a kind of fresco of urban life in the 1990s. If earlier films had addressed popular, primarily lower class audiences, which often as in the classic Nosotros los Pobres were idealized as another repository of Mex Mexicanness, G. Iñárritu's first film was explicitly aimed at a middle class viewer familiar with the rapid cutting and abrupt transitions made popular by MTV and with the aesthetics of US independent film. As numerous critics have noted, the evolution of the film going public in Mexico underlies the stylistic changes from the populist melodramas of the golden age to the, at least in appearance, more sophisticated and cosmopolitan films of the three amigos and their contemporaries. Film going went from a popular activity to a middle class one. But G. Iñárritu and his two amigos also break with the Nuevo, Nuevo Cine Mexicano, New Mexican Cinema, that is the filmmakers who came of age in the late 1960s and 1970s, such as Paul Leduc, Arturo Ripstein, and Jaime Humberto Hermosillo. Their films are characterized by an attempt at updating the melodramatic frameworks of earlier nationalistic golden age cinema from a supposedly politically progressive position. However, many of their works exhibit in Ignacio, Ignacio Sanchez Prado's works, a telling distaste for urban popular classes that was a departure from their idealization by the Golden Age films. This negative de depiction of the poor would have its roots in Los Olvidados, Buñuel's classic film and a strong candidate for the greatest movie ever made in Mexico. It is a searing portrayal of the lumpen proletariat that is the urban poor who live by their wits, often outside the law. This negative view of the poor seen ultimately as brutal, stupid, and immoral, arguably contradicted the left-wing positions of the then new Mexican filmmakers, but may very well have been an expression of their disillusionment at the rejection of radical politics by the country's masses in the 1960s and 1970s. One could even argue that it also reflects the restructuring of the Mexican audience from the, from the we implicit in nosotros los pobres, literally, we the poor, to the middle class viewers who see films in multiplexes located in upper class shopping centers and for whom the urban and rural and rural poor are always the other. I actually had a much better picture, but I couldn't get one that fit. But anyway, I, I think you get there the sense of nobility in, in, in the depiction of los pobres. Uh, I was born without Mexican cinema, G. Iñárritu has stated, thus denying any connection with the Mexican film tradition, whether in its golden age or new cinema periods. There are, of course, obvious differences between G. Iñárritu and the former new Mexican filmmakers. For instance, it is hard to see in G. Iñárritu, who was once a successful marketing executive and who begins and ends filming with actors and crew chanting, Abba Eli, God the Father, in Aramaic, and throwing rose petals in the air as anything resembling a traditional radical. 
one can see echoes of the former profession in the rapid cutting of his earlier films, which can be traced back as much to commercials as to music videos, and of, the, of an orthodox religious belief in Sean Penn's Christ-like sacrifice in 21 Grams, and more recently, perhaps, in Beautiful's unclassifiable spiritualism. Moreover, unlike the new cinema directors who perhaps reluctantly remain making films thematically Mexican, Jean Yaritu rapidly became a transnational filmmaker. Nevertheless, it is possible to find in the Arriaga Prieto trilogy a continuation of the new Mexican cinema's representation of the poor. They, the poor, engage openly in activities that we, as the implied audience of middle class, urban, perhaps repressed individuals, do not. One has dogfights and robberies in Amores Perros, not to mention contract killings. 21 Grams has a born again Jack Jordan, played by Benicio del Toro, exhibiting a religious emotionalism very different from our, I guess, Aramaic chanting middle class New Age version of Christianity. Even Babel, despite its purported multiculturalism, exhibits traces of this negative portrayal of the poor. For instance, the shepherd boy and his slightly older sister engage in voyeurism and exhibitionism. The Mexican wedding party includes such atypical activities as, as killing a chicken on screen, a post-doc fighting, pre-classical conducting, Gael Garcia Bernal is really good at it. And apparently, the nanny having an affair with an old friend, leaving the children with no one looking after them for however long the tryst lasts. Of course, the middle class characters do not behave in, immaculate, in an immaculate manner. The realism characteristic of contemporary cinema precludes the extreme idealization of any social group. But for instance, in Babel, the US and Japanese characters who are perhaps reductively upper or middle class, while the poor are Moroccan and Mexican, behave in manners that even when extreme are understandable. Thus, Chieko, the deaf Japanese girl, tries to explore her sexuality in order to compensate for the loss of her mother and the apparent indifference of her father, Richard, before the movie begins, had left his family after the loss of their newborn child, and by means of the trip to Morocco, is trying to mend fences with his wife. Although I won't deal with this, one can see that in these subplots, perhaps uh, the melodramatic, root, me melodramatic Mexican roots of González Iñárritu. More importantly, one finds this negative view of the poor in the structure of Iñárritu's trilogy. In the three films, it is the poor who cause the tragedy that sets the plot in motion. Thus, in Amores Perros, the dogfighters' car chase and crash connect the three plot lines. Those of the dogfighters, the advertising man who leaves his wife for a model, she loses her leg in the accident, and that of El Chivo, a contract killer who adopts the wounded fighting dog. In 21 Grams, even being born again, does not, make, does not make a good driver of Jack Jordan, who careens down a residential street and does not stop to help Christina Peck, that is Naomi Watts, two daughters and husband. In Babel, the child shepherds inexplicably decide to test their rifle by trying to hit a tourist bus, and surprise, they hit a tourist. Somewhat tongue-in-cheek, David Bordwell has described the drama, uh, has described Babel, as fundamentally about how prosperous white people have to suffer because Asian, Mexican, and North African men have guns. They also suffer because they have Mexican nannies. Amelia makes the mistaken decision to, have her, to take her two wards to Mexico, despite her lack of a work permit or a document authorizing her to, to, to take the children across the border. And instead of hurrying back, as soon as possible, she stays, has a tryst, and waits for her chicken-killing nephew Santiago to get drunk, which is, leads him into a fight with the San Diego Border Patrol to escape and inexplicably to dump her aunt and the children in the middle of the desert. Some have argued that Babel shows how the international order 
is weighed against the poor. After all, while the Joneses are able to go to Morocco, even if it's to get shot, Amelia and Santiago have to submit to the unfriendly control of the San Diego Border Patrol. Even when Amelia is found after having left the two children in the desert, the Border Patrol is more concerned with handcuffing her than with finding the kids. In a manner consistent with Jean Yarity's words quoted before, Babel would thus be showing us the other side, not generally seen in a Hollywood film. I would, however, argue that instead, that by mapping onto the world the description of the poor he may have inherited from the New Mexican cinema, and by incorporating into the global the neoliberal model of Mexican society pre presented in Amores Perros, the behavior of the poor makes them necessarily losers. It is impossible to imagine Amelia or Santiago ever achieving the social status of Susan, Richard, Yasujiro, or Checo. None of the poor behave in ways that highlight the existence of inequality and the social structures and practices that help reproduce it. In fact, even the brutal behavior of the Moroccan police who torture the Berbers and, and, and shoot Yusef or the harsh treatment of Amelia at the hand of the border patrol fit very well with neoliberal criticism of the state and its institutions. After all, Susan almost dies because of the inefficiency of US diplomats in Morocco. Despite Jean Yaritu's claim that Babel ultimately presents an egalitarian vision of the world, it repeats the hierarchies that characterize actually existing globalization. Not only are Brad Pitt and, Clay, and Kate Blanchett the main stars, but also the story ultimately revolves around Richard and Susan's ordeal, as in reality, where US culture, society, and more importantly, corporations have till now been the driving force and the benefiters of globalization, it is the US plot line around which, around which the other stories revolve. The importance of the Moroccan and Mexican characters, perhaps even the Japanese, ultimately resides in their role in the development of the plot. As we all know, as we all know, G. Nyaritu broke with his collaborator Arriaga after Babel and embarked on a new period of his career that abandons the interlocking story that had been his stock in trade and progressively substitutes long takes for the MTV cutting of the, early, of the earlier films. After a for now final film in Spanish, Beautiful, still shot by Prieto, he dropped his paternal last name, Gonzalez, began collaborating with another Mexican director of photography, Emmanuel Lubezki, Cuaron's longtime collaborator, and won two directing Oscars in a row, a feat only pre previously achieved by such respected names as Joseph Mankiewicz, the director of All About Eve, and the legendary John Ford. I'll leave to others more knowledgeable than I to find any continuity between Bertman, The Revenant, and the earlier trilogy. <laughs> 